Is it irrational to be an anti-rationalist? Should all of human nature be viewed through a scientific lens of, a, of an enlightened generation that casts all priestly theology to the side, seeing it as something dangerously committed to an ideology that had no room for civil society, whose history has been nothing but nasty, brutish, and short? I'm Pebio, and this is Pay Attention, and today we'll be looking at a few of the philosophers who opposed the Enlightenment early on, and whose philosophy is in between and woven throughout the stern and drum movement and the prose within. Well before the Enlightenment, a unique view of nature was stirring. Renaissance art had mathematical representations of the human body and depicted natural phenomena that would later contribute to the scientific revolution. Most notably, Copernicus, Kepler, and the physics of Galileo. A revival of Platonic ideas surrounded the Renaissance, particularly mathematics being a critical point in understanding reality. With the resurgence of these ideas during the early years of the Renaissance, a scientific revolution was the necessary trail to be paved. Now, while the scientific revolution was rapidly transforming the individual's role in the universe and the individual's role in society, traditional views were being held on trial, being judged under the empirical eye of reason. The old medieval scholastic's view of reasonating theology was being replaced by an analysis of nature as reason's primary focus. Mysticism, the concept of miracles and phenomenon that was traditionally believed to be uh, spiritual intervention, uh, was being rounded under the umbrella of vulgar superstitions. The scientific revolution did away with ancient texts and replaced it with knowledge gained through observation and experimentation. Earthquakes were no longer the expression of an angry god, but the voice of nature's indifference. And finally, the spark of genius that began in the 14th century renaissance, passed on to the scientific revolution, would light the way for the age of reason and freedom. And during a century which would see some of the most brutal and violent revolutions uh, inflamed by economic disparity and set forth by the ideas of the Enlightenment thinkers. The Enlightenment was a time of independent thinking and authority, valuing science and technology above the credulous beliefs of the supernatural, reevaluating nature's role and placing upon it a more secular interpretation. New political theories were being set forth that would change political thought throughout the Western world, such as John Locke's Two Treaties of Government and Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. However, along with every major paradigm shift within an era, there come the usual counter-movement. Although the term counter-enlightenment was not coined until much later on, ideas that challenged enlightened thought were immediately recognized. The one most notable and most important to the Sturm und Drang movement would be a philosopher, friend of Immanuel Kant, Johann G. Hamann. Though his name may not be as recognized as his contemporaries such as David Hume and Adam Smith, he nonetheless had a major role in the lives of those who would shape much of the current mentality. In fact, it was Hammond who had introduced Hume's work to Kant, sparking one of the most documented philosophical feuds in history. Though his work has consisted of small essays, fragments being published in 1819, his impact and challenges to the Enlightenment's conviction to reason did not go unnoticed. In his essay, Aesthetica and Nusa, he would exemplify the values of an aesthetic experience, putting the emphasis on senses and poetic language to undermine the abstract concepts of reason. 
At the time Hammond was writing these essays, there was no movement that was considered uh, counter-enlightenment, only uh, individual attacks on the sovereignty of reason and the authority given over to the senses as the primary tool in discovering the natural world around them. His conviction to faith and belief as being the driving force for knowledge made him an outcast to the Enlightenment. But where the Enlightenment had abandoned such notions that he held close, a proto-romantic movement had picked them up as a way to rationalize their irrational emotions in an ever-changing world that was overwhelming them that, with, with, with sensations that could not be explained through reason alone. With the Enlightenment devouring all conversations in philosophy and science, Hammond's uh, firm grip on tradition gave an alternative in comprehending nature, art, and the very human aspect in experiencing what cannot be expressed otherwise. With this came a literary term that would take the art world over and uh, pose a very serious problem to philosophers, most notably Edmund Burke. This word, of course, I'm talking about is the word sublime, which we will cover in a later video as there will be a lot to go over. Hammond's importance to the Stern and Drang movement far outreaches any other philosopher of his time, uh, being a, a mentor to Herder and having great influence on Goethe and his writing. But for now, let's take a look at the influence of one other philosopher who had a major impact on the movement, but who was also considered a great thinker of the Enlightenment. Let's turn it over to our friend Stellar to tell us a little more. Chains are born with government and everywhere freedom has nothing to lose but its government. No, that's not right. Truly a man of the Enlightenment, writing compositions in opera and ballet, writing comedies, epistolary novels, philosophy, and contributing to politics that is still quite relevant to this day. Rousseau really was a Jacques of all trades. However, being someone who had a profound impact on the Enlightenment didn't mean that he uh, was exempt from challenging it. In 1750, uh, Rousseau won a writing contest in which uh, he critiques the Enlightenment. This was an essay titled the, uh, A Method on the Moral Effects of the Arts and Sciences. In this essay, he argues how the Enlightenment thinkers moved away from their nature, not by way of virtue, but by way of studying virtue. He points to past societies and where ever the arts and sciences were on the rise, virtue and value would decline. As the arts and sciences took the forefront in ancient Greece and ancient Egypt, virtue became more a study and less a practice. Because it is out of human vices in which the arts and sciences are conceived, science is a result of vain curiosity, while moral philosophy is pursued due to pride. He believed that science couldn't contribute to morals and uh, only took people away from their natural state of being, in which they would then only focus on uh, selfish luxuries. Where Johann G. Hermann attacked the superiority of reason, Rousseau attacked the method. Of course, Rousseau would go on to uh, challenge many of the previous thinkers, uh, most notably Hobbes, with uh, his uh, social contract saying quite the opposite, where Hobbes usually agrees that people are uh, born pretty awful human beings. Rousseau says quite the opposite. Uh, which is something that's quite common in the Stern and Young era and the authors there, where people are naturally just good and good in the sense of uh, innocent. The uh, main contributor, of course, to corruption would be government. And uh, who's going to argue with that one? You can 
Rousseau was really the first uh, anarchy and peace kind of guy. Though Rousseau didn't believe that it was impossible to resist the corruption that the government would eventually uh, uh, rain down on its people, some notable people he uh, actually calls out that were able to maintain themselves during the Enlightenment, such as Newton and Descartes, it was uh, something that was exceptionally rare. But of course, the average person will be corrupted by these Enlightenment ideas, and it was such sentiments that made Rousseau a champion of the Sturm und Drang movement. And uh, back to nature, back to feelings, back to irrational relationships that end in suicide, naturally. Thank you, Stellar. Well, no, it is true that Hammond and uh, Rousseau were the two primary philosophers to attack the Enlightenment. It is also important to note that their contribution to the philosophical debate uh, far outreaches that alone, such as Hammond's uh, contribution to the hermeneutical study, looking at uh, the reader's and writer's relationship. But for now, in regard to the Sturm und Drang movement, it is best to understand their stance against much of what the Enlightenment was taking to be absolute empirical truth. So I hope this helped. And next week we'll be looking at the sublime and the argument it poses against rationality. Hi, just a quick final word on the articles listed below. The first article here titled Galileo and the Art of Reasoning, edited by Robert Cohen and Mark Swartovsky. It was published by D. Raydell Publishing Company in 1942 uh, through Boston Studies in Philosophy and Science. So I've only read uh, the first chapter titled Faith versus Reason, the rhetorical form of content of Galileo's dialogue. It does have a detailed analysis on how the scientific revolution was changing public opinion, lending a clear and steady path to, to the Enlightenment. Um, the second article, titled A Contemporary in Descent, Johann Hammond as a Radical Enlightener by Oswald Bayer, was originally published in 1988 and again in 2012 by WMB Eardham's Publishing Co. So this book is a bit of a longer read uh, while going over it for this episode. It is a thorough look into Hammond's philosophy uh, on every subject he touched on, from faith, reason, anthropology, language, and his relationships with other philosophers such as Kant and Herder. Anyone who's interested in his work after watching this episode, is, this would be, uh, be the best place to start that I, that I could find anyway. And uh, the final article here titled The Faith of Reason and the Idea of Progress in the French Enlightenment by Charles Frankel. It was published in 1948 by Columbia University Press. Uh, there's a list of ways to download the free PDF file there, so I hope it's not too difficult to pull up. It gives an in-depth analysis of many of the Enlightenment philosophers, such as Voltaire and uh, who we looked at today, uh, Rousseau. So uh, I hope that helps with the papers, and thanks for watching, and hope to see you next week.